Now, Khrushchev met with U.S. President Eisenhower, who was looking to end the Cold War by making an arms deal with the Soviets. Eisenhower also wanted to deal with the, quote, China problem. At this point, the U.S. had toyed with the idea of dropping a nuke on Taiwan to cripple China. I mean, isn't it funny that the only country that used nukes and then threatened another country to use nukes is the only one claiming that we need to rein in certain countries with nuclear capabilities? I mean, shouldn't the rest of the world be trying to rein in the nuke-thirsty U.S. empire? Boy, if sense was common. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Before we get into this episode, I want to let you guys know that if you want to be in the virtual audience for one of these recordings, you can do so by getting a ticket uh, on the last Thursday of every single month where I do these Zoom shows and it's a new show every month talking about another kind of big sociopolitical topic. So if you're interested in that last Thursday of every month, you can grab your tickets, come join us in the Zoom virtual theater and be a part of these Forkful of Noodles recordings. You can find that ticket information over on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. While you're there, you can check out all of my stand-up comedy albums, you can check out past episodes of this show, my interview show, Taboo Table Talk, and the live stream, more riffy show that I do about current events and news stories called Road Reflections. Again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. And if you're interested in, in supporting this show financially, you can do so on the website as well by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member and making monthly contributions. To those that are already making monthly contributions, I really, really appreciate you guys and you guys help make this show better with each contribution. All right, now let's get right into the episode. China. This is probably one of the most controversial topics to discuss in capitalist America. If you bring up China at a party, I mean, that's it, right? The night is over. Everyone has to go home because it's sure to turn into a screaming match about who read the most accurate headline about China that day, right? And a lot of Americans don't even really understand why they're supposed to hate China other than the fact that they're commie reds that are coming to suck the soul out of every Christian baby in America. Capitalists like George Soros have called China an existential competitor to the United States. But wait a minute, isn't competition good for capitalism? I mean, that's what's preached to us nonstop by the simps of the system. So why would it be bad to have a competitor? I mean, shouldn't that mean that America is pushed to produce better things? Shouldn't that mean that America should be trying to be as good, if not better, than a society in, than China? I mean, China's Common Prosperity Program is des described as, quote, not good for investors. And as capitalist business leaders in America describe China as an existential threat, capitalist politicians are pushing for a full-on hot war with China. The United States has two partnerships that militaristically are threatening China. The Quad, consisting of the U.S., Australia, Japan, and India, and AUKUS, which consists of the U.S., the U.K., and Australia. And yes, it also sounds like a species of platypus that is just really socially awkward. Also, does anyone else feel like the U.S. is trying to fuck Australia? I mean, look, I get it. Australia was a British prison colony, and everybody loves a bad boy that their parents are going to hate. Plus, they got a pretty cool accent, you know, and militarism is the only way America knows how to flirt. Want to see how far I can fly my drone? Hey, 
Is that a nuclear sub in your pants or are you just excited for imperialism? I bet the size of my Navy gets your inland real wet. Right now, China has a 20% favorability rating among average Americans. But this is the hypocritical way liberals behave towards this giant, right? They claim China is evil and violates human rights, but we should stop spreading Asian hate, you guys. It's just a, a lot of mixed signals. So what's behind all this hatred and hypocrisy? In order to understand that, we'd have to delve into the history of China and Americans' involvement in their growth. China's main goal since the revolution that put the Communist Party in power back in 1949 is to build a socialist society. In the early part of the 20th century, thanks to British imperialism and the opium trade, China lost a lot of power in the global markets. The Brits had embarrassed this once proud nation with unbeatable dynasties by essentially turning them into a drug mule. They were basically like a college student that loses all their money in Mexico and has to transport cocaine in their butt to get home. Plus, after the Japanese invasion during World War II, China, China was torn apart by the ravages of war. 30 million Chinese lives were lost in the 14 years of warfare they faced. So after the communists won the revolution in 1949, it was time to rebuild the country. And China's economy was weak. Mao Zedong's goal was to eradicate poverty from China. But Mao also had to keep the nation unified. So in order to help this socialist project get off the ground, he turned to Joseph Stalin, which, look, I get that looks bad. But lest we forget, without Stalin's help, the U.S. and the Allied forces wouldn't have beat Hitler in World War II. The problem with Stalin was that he wasn't ready to turn into a capitalist state after the war. Mao and Stalin primarily talk about peace. And look, again, I, I get that it's hard to believe that someone like Joseph Stalin would want to talk about peace, but, eh, you know, maybe that was because he was older and the Nazis didn't really seem like that much of a problem at that time, right? I get it. You know, I'm older now, you know, and I only want to burn things down like 60% of the time. But Stalin agreed to help China by sending scientists, technology, and resources to help get their economy off the ground. By the first year, Mao overturned several marriage laws that were in place from the old regime. In 1950, the marriage law, one of the first uh, laws that was enacted by the PRC was this marriage law that looked at this basically centuries long of feudal patriarchal marriages and then ending a lot of the most brutal practices, which is child marriage, arranged marriages, uh, banned polygamy that was only allowed for men, uh, and 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 allow and also mandated the actual registration of um, of uh, marriages that also allowed women to to be human beings, you know, as individuals, yeah. human beings, but also a possibility to exit divorce, to leave their uh, their you know possibly abusive or whatever marriages they were in. So that's I mean one of the first things that ex was experienced in, under the PRC. On top of that, more hospitals were being built and Mao focused his attention on agriculture. In the 50s, the U.S. slapped sanctions on China because they supported the Korean independence rather than U.S. imperialism. Tensions started to build between the Soviets and the Chinese, and they only get worse when Stalin dies and Khrushchev takes over. Both nations wanted the same thing, a sovereign socialist state but were bickering over the execution of the plan. The Soviets believed that China was moving too fast. But by 1959, things were reaching a boiling point between the two socialist giants. Now, Khrushchev met with U.S. President Eisenhower, who was looking to end the Cold War by making an arms deal with the Soviets. Eisenhower also wanted to deal with the, quote, China problem. At this point, the U.S. had toyed with the idea of dropping a nuke on Taiwan to cripple China. I mean, isn't it funny that the only country that used nukes and then threatened another country to use nukes 
is the only one claiming that we need to rein in certain countries with nuclear capabilities. I mean, shouldn't the rest of the world be trying to rein in the nuke-thirsty U.S. empire? Boy, if sense was common. Now, Mao and the Chinese see making amends with an imperial power as a betrayal to the construction of a socialist society. So they started writing about how the Soviets were imperialist and socialist posers. Like, do you even like dis redistribute, bro? Okay, do you even lift the working class out of poverty and share the means of production with them? Bro, like, do you even live the revolution? So the Soviets responded by abruptly calling all of those scientists back and cutting off resources and advancements to China. Khrushchev went against the first principle of socialism. Sharing is caring. Apparently, he no longer cared. During this period is also when the Sino-Soviet split uh, was happening. And so, you know, in the late 50s till early 61, you actually had overnight thousands of experts, agricultural experts, industrial experts, hundreds of projects, development projects that stopped overnight. Soviet Union withdrew them all in a night. And of course, then the country had to go and repay its debt quickly. So there was a huge amount of conjuncture of factors um, that was at play that did um, have a uh, role in playing in terms of people being hungry and people starving in a history where this has been the history of my people has been dealing with how to feed that many people. The Soviet scientists were very confused about this decision. This was rather devastating to the socialist cause, right? This is like watching two best buds throwing their friendship away because they can't agree on who the best X-Man is. The answer is Gambit, obviously. The answer is Gambit's the best X-Man. He's, he's, he's great. He's great. Look, I'll prove it. This is Gambit as a Funko Pop, and he's got a cat. I mean, the ba do you really think a bad guy would have a cat? Come on. That is just ridiculous. Look, this was a catastrophe for China. With crippling U.S. sanctions and the loss of the Soviet support, China's burgeoning socialist economy was collapsing. With all that and Mao's strict new agriculture law, China saw a wave of starvation in the early 60s, and things only got worse in this decade. A quick, a quick, quick side note here. I know Mao's wave of starvation is used by capitalists as a proof of the failures of socialism, but that argument disregards the sanctions and the Soviet support. But more importantly, it ignores the consistent wave of homelessness and starvation in capitalist nations like the U.S. Don't forget, thanks to how U.S. capitalism dealt with the pandemic, homelessness and starvation rose in the last two years, and capitalism has yet to deal with those issues. And not only did America invade Vietnam and bringing war to the doorsteps of China, they had to deal with border skirmishes between India and the Soviet Union in the 60s as well. But this gave America's oldest living war criminal, Henry Kissinger, the perfect opportunity to take out both the Southeast Asian and Eastern European socialist blocs. He had a simple plan. Quote, we want both sides to kill each other. Now, after meeting Mao in secret, Kissinger arranged for Nixon to meet him publicly in 1975. The, this was Nixon trying to regain goodwill in the eyes of the international community after the blunders of Vietnam. This was him subtly saying, I am blah, 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 blah. In, in regular English and not Nixonian English. It, it, that translates to I, I, I am not a crook just in case anybody couldn't hear through the jowls. It won't be until 1979, three years after Mao dies, that China will become legitimized in the, eyes, in the world's eyes by President Jimmy Carter. At this point, thanks to wars breaking out in the South Pacific, socialism was eroding. Legitimizing China was a terrifying decision. The military industrial complex actually penned a letter to Carter telling him to reverse course on this decision 
and how China was a victim of socialist or, or rather Soviet imperialism. And I, for one, am shocked to learn that the military industrial complex is literate. I mean, did you guys know they could read? That is amazing. Good for them, huh? With the whole literacy thing. What a what an advancement. Now, once China was open to the globe, they started rising to the world stage. American capitalists were very excited about China's inclusion to the world, world market. They figured that China would be seduced into neoliberal greed and would become a capitalist state that America can control. But China used this to boost their economy and start raising their own citizens out of poverty. In the 80s, Russia's new leader, Gorbachev, decides to reopen relations with China uh, after their feud in the 60s. Seeing this move as an insult, students decided to protest and effectively shut down the Chinese government for seven weeks. This is what led up to the famous Tiananmen Square incident. But there are a lot of discrepancies on what actually happened there. The student in the famous photo was alive and well. He was never arrested by the government for protesting. And this incident was days after any violence had taken place. The student, protester, uh, student protesters had started the violence when the military arrived outside the square by taking arms away from them. And no bystander was actually killed by the Chinese military. But the military did open fire on its citizens in retaliation. I mean, their weapons were taken away, so they had to fight back somehow. But how is that any different than what happened at Kent State or any labor action in the early 1900s or the Black Lives Matter protest or any other protest that has taken place in America over the last century? It's not. So America should just really shut the fuck up before it contorts its brain, its brain into a perma pretzel from all of this mental gymnastics. Now, the 90s is when things really start to turn around for China. At this point, they're making the most desirable products uh, and has basically become the world's manufacturer. Rapid industrialization has taken its toll on China's climate, but this is a consequence of rapid industrialization itself. The same thing happened in the States, UK, India, and so on. So every neoliberal establishment trying to harp on China's climate problem is ludicrous when they haven't fixed their own crises. I mean, for fuck's sake, California has a fire season, right? The southern states have a hurricane season, and that's just in America. If you have seasons for natural disasters, you're a failed state working on becoming a failed planet. By 1997, the last vestiges of colonial control were released when Hong Kong returned to Chinese control from the 100-year UK lease. Basically, this was like the Crown's international gentrification plan. I believe Hong Kong was supposed to become a royal brunch spot. But this was a signal to the world. China was becoming its own sovereign, independent state without the influence of the West. Now, Hong Kong is like China's Puerto Rico, right? They want their own independent independence and are democratic, but still under the control of a world power. It was only after 9-11 that China was added into the World Trade Organization. And this was another controversial decision because capitalists again thought they would fall for the siren call of lady capitalism, but that didn't happen. In order to put more pressure on China, the Obama administration was pushing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have devastated the global working class and made more capitalists very, very rich. And they increased the number of military bases in the Pacific Southeast. This brings us to today and China's Common Prosperity Program under President Xi Jinping. Under this new leadership and growth in China's economy, the goal was to continue constructing a socialist society, and that idea was being pushed forward. In order to eradicate poverty, China decided to look at po the poverty standard under a new lens. So in China, the extreme poverty level is set at the equivalent of $2.30 uh, a day. Um, and this is 
just to let you know, the World Bank uses a dollar and ninety cents per day. So the China standard is actually a bit higher than that. Um, but the Chinese um, uh, approach wasn't just around income alone. I think what's more important to focus is these two other aspects I mentioned: the two assurances, which is that you don't have to worry about food and clothing, and then the three guarantees, which is that you are provided um, basic medical services, free and compulsory education, which in China is nine years. Uh, and then safe housing, and, and they define safe housing as not only the structure of the housing, but that it has uh, safe uh, drinking water as well as electricity. So the actual program itself followed a what's called a multi-dimensional approach to looking at poverty. It's not just about handing out money, and it's not just about your income, but actually kind of the various facets about what produces poverty and what maintains pro poverty. Uh, so according to this um, metrics, you know, the one income, two assurances, three guarantees, uh, the last 100 million people were lifted out of extreme poverty in the last eight years. And that, as you mentioned in the figure of 800 million, that's the last 100 of that 850 million people. And just to get a sense of what that scale, what that number means, I mean, it almost seems too big to understand. It's, yeah. um, it's the equivalent of lifting up the Latin America plus the Caribbean and most of the U.S. combined together. It would be if all of that population was living in extreme <laughs> poverty that was lifted. And so globally in this last four decades, um, China's poverty eradication um, programs actually lifted 76% of the world's uh, poor. So contributed 76% yeah. of the global reduction poverty. If you're a conservative, think of this as getting the boots that you would pick yourself up by. So in order to build infrastructure to do this, China had to figure out exactly what the problem was and how to find adequate solutions to uplift its people. So initially in 2014, uh, 800,000 party members were sent to do that initial household survey like you mentioned. So that's literally going to the countryside, uh, a total of 132,000 uh, uh, villages and counties and knocking on households to figure out each family's income sources. What is their education level? What are the conditions of the housing, uh, like health conditions? And from there, they were able to identify that 100 million people and put it into a national database of uh, people who actually registered in the program. That's the initial phase of identification. Then, as you mentioned, the 3 million people who were sent, of course, they're full-time party cadre, they were carefully selected members, usually with some sort of, um, you know, uh, higher education or some specialization, whether it's in agriculture or in engineering or something that could be useful in the process. Um, and they go and live in these communities for one to three years uh, at a time, full-time. And, you know, even visiting home uh, can be difficult times because they're fully, you know, dispatched to the villages. And we, we also met with a couple of these uh, cadres that were actually involved in, and you see what the daily life looks like. You know, um, the cell phone is constantly ringing. Uh, usually uh, each uh, cadre is actually assigned to one household. And then uh, the, then these cadres make up a team uh, and each village is assigned a team. And the team is made of not only, not only the people who is dispatched, but also obviously local leaders, uh, local officials, community um, leaders as well, together they form a team that basically follow uh, the progress of, um, of everyone in the village, including those who are specifically registered in the program. Um, and so their basic work is, I mean, it's, it's the, for anyone who's ever done any kind of community organizing work, it's that day-to-day -day stuff. Um, it's, you know, Mr. Wong saying, oh, um, come here, uh, my front door lock is not, is broken. Um, can you come help me fix it? Or it's Mrs. Zhang's son, he's not going to school and she's worried about it. So can you please come over and talk to him and, and like tell him why education is important and can you help us out there? Could be someone's aunt is sick or you know, someone's father lost a job. Um, and so that's the kind of daily role that people were playing. Uh, in addition to creating those plans or helping the families come up with plans to figure out how they can be lifted out of poverty, whether it's through you know, employment, through creating agricultural production, creating you know, access to markets, a variety of ways that can happen. Now, look, I get it. The second anyone here in the West hears this, they go, well, this sounds 
like it's going to get in the way of my rights and my freedoms. All right. What if I don't want to fix locks and help people? OK, so you want the freedom to be a sociopath. Well, buddy, I got an exceptional country you, you should check out that's built on being a sociopathic shitbag and uses a, uh, the, the idea of freedom as an excuse to give up their humanity. Corporations, billionaires, and CEOs are also heavily regulated in China. Due to these regulations, Chinese billionaires actually lost up to 90% of their wealth. But don't worry, you guys, because they're still billionaires. Look, I think if you lose almost everything you have and still wind up being richer than over 95% of the world, then you have too much money. Okay, that's one of those sentences you really shouldn't have to say out loud, but because we live in a fractured reality, you absolutely have to say out loud. The reason why China is an emerging global power that's a threat to imperial dominance is because they use the Communist Party to control private industries. When China opened itself up to the globe, they decided to keep larger things like land under public control. This way, real estate corporations can't arbitrarily spike rent on apartment buildings on land that they're leasing from the government without losing control of their properties. And China also learned from its own mistakes and the mistakes of its rivals. U.S. capitalism tried to achieve social goals through privatization. The social goals being an upward transfer of wealth and putting a price tag on everything from socks to identity to democracy itself. The USSR tried to achieve its goals through public enterprises and funnel more control to the government. But thanks to the paranoia of the nuclearly charged Cold War, both nations focused their economic successes on the military. China coordinated uh, China decided to coordinate public and private enterprises together to ensure that the beneficiary of the profit would be the Chinese people. And guess what? That includes billionaires and the capitalists that live in China. The goal is to create a stable economy without constant booms and busts like capitalism. And they're succeeding. As we mentioned earlier, over the last 30 years, 850 million people have been uplifted from poverty in China. That's 76% of the world's poverty. In America, the number of people that have been uplifted from poverty is equivalent to the number of billionaires this country has. So like eight people, like, like eight people have been uplifted from poverty in America. So I believe monetarily, America has eradicated negative 400% of the poverty in the world. Look, China is far from a perfect country because humans are still in charge, but there's still corruption and greed at every level of their class structure. But the difference is that they're trying to do something about it. America wants people to give into that greed because they've given into that greed and they want everybody else to give into that same greed. But when it's met with a nation that it can't bend to its whims, it throws a temper tantrum in the ways of propaganda. China is proving the adage that sharing is caring is rather profitable. Now, Americans are the most propagandized people in the world. Right, How China is depicted in American corporate media is a glaring example of how propagandized Americans really are. It shows how China has a 20% favorability in America, and people still talk shit on China constantly, but hashtag stop Asian hate trends on Twitter pretty consistently. One of the biggest pieces of propaganda we hear about China is, is their nonstop human rights abuses. And when people ask for proof, the corporate media shows a blurry photo of what could also just be a, a sonogram. But where did where, where they did show some proof uh, was the violence against the Muslim Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Uh, but it, of course, was all a hoax from manipulated data. American corporate media was reporting about a genocide of the Muslim Uyghur population based on a paper published by Adrian Zenz, a right-wing scholar and evangelical Christian. 
Now, according to Zenz, there is a, quote, demographic genocide of the Muslim Uyghurs in, quote, authoritarian China. Before we go on here, we should really address the term right-wing scholar. I'm sure if you're a reader like myself, that term gave you a migraine. That's like saying friendly shark or productive politician or racist intellectual. Right? It just it just doesn't add up in your brain. And, and if it does, look, I'm afraid you're having a nonstop stroke and you should very much consult a doctor and probably also a library. I'm sorry, library. I, I will say that in your native tongue. You should go to the library. Okay, so Adrian Zenz is not just an oxymoron, but he's also a Christian fundamentalist that doesn't believe in LGBTQ rights or gender e equality. He also says he's, quote, led by God to bring down China. All right, name one time in human history where someone has claimed that they're, quote, led by God and it didn't end in bloodshed. I'll give you a second. Did, did, you, did, you, figure, did you figure it out? Because I, I don't think you can. You just can't because it's never happened. The only reason we tolerate this kind of stuff is because he's anti-socialism and rich. If he was an average Joe making these sorts of claims, he would be institutionalized. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't God make Chinese people too? So wouldn't they be children of God as well? So why would God make one of his kids kill another bunch of his kids? I mean, that sounds pretty fucked up to me. Like, like even Shakespeare wouldn't come up with a tragedy this insane. Okay, so let's break down exactly what's happening in China and how the real information got filtered through the diagnosably schizophrenic brain of Adrian Zenz. Between 2010 and 2018, the Uyghur population grew by about 25%. The native Chinese Han population grew by about a million people at that time. Now, the Han's population, the population growth was regulated because of China's one-child policy. In 1979, China's one-child policy was used to limit the growth of the population so they could stabilize their economy and allocate resources appropriately. But at that same time, the policy also included intrusive methods like monitoring menstruation and uh, coerced sterilization, along with monetary fines. Now, this was called, and I'm using the scientific term here, being a fucking creep. But hey, how is that different than what the Republicans want to do with women's health in America in 2021? The Uyghur population was exempt from this law, but was still somewhat regulated. The Uyghurs were allotted two to three kids, depending on where they lived. In 2015, under Xi Jinping, this law was relaxed. Everyone could have up to two kids in urban areas and three in rural areas. The focus of this new plan was family planning and sexual education, along with making contraception more available to people in all communities. In 2017, China's National Health and Planning Commission put about $5.2 billion into their infrastructure to ensure that people's health was a priority. They offered free mental health services and inoculations as part of this plan. Now, after 2015, the infant mortality rates and life expectancy rose everywhere in China, but particularly in the Xinjiang province. And a new generation of more sexually liberated people were not looking to have children. And this is what contributed to the decrease in birth rates in the world's most populated country. Now, Article 2D of the Geneva Convention states that a, quote, demographic genocide would be, quote, imposing measures to prevent births within the group and is qualified by those acts, quote, committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. Preventing births isn't genocide. It's birth control. I mean, condoms prevent births. Are you saying that the Trojan man is a genocidal maniac that gets commercials during America's Got Talent? Do you really believe the phrase, wrap it before you tap it, is a call to bring back the death camps? I mean, it can be seen 
that way from the perspective of like a like a sperm uh, birth control well guys that's just in the name it controls births more accurately it controls whether you want to have births or not now zenz's paper also shows a photo of an elderly couple getting a health checkup and reports that as intrusive birth control methods <laughs> what Look, no one over the age of 50 is trying to have kids, you know, unless they're the punchline of a Tracy Morgan joke. We'll go get a pregnant. We'll go get a pregnant. That's the best Tracy Morgan you're going to get out of me. And because the State Department published Zenz's paper, they didn't peer review it or corroborate his stories. I mean, really, why look for proof when all you want is manipulated data for the sake of propaganda? Guys, facts don't care about your feelings, but propaganda will gaslight you to think your feelings don't even exist. China specialist Lyle Goldstein countered Zenz's paper and added that the Uyghurs are repressed in China far more than what lefty socialist progressives like myself would like, but there is no evidence of a genocide. In fact, with how much China puts into their health care, it sounds like they're trying to improve their lives. Oh, I get it. I figured it out. It's a monetary genocide. Sociopathic capitalists like Adrian Zenz look at how much money is being put into the healthcare program as a genocide of cash. G guys, look, helping people kills cash, okay? Won't somebody please think about the Benjamins? And like the U.S. has any grounds to talk about the persecution of a minority community when minorities have been a victim of America's foreign and domestic policies constantly. I mean, how many Muslim countries is America at war with? A fucking bunch of them. How many extreme fundamentalist groups has America armed gleefully? I'll give you a hint. It's fucking all of them. Peace isn't good for business. Hell, I'm Indian, and I've been caught in anti-Muslim hate. Through the lens of xenophobic nationalism, anything brown with facial hair is a potential threat. I bet we did have the second coming of Christ, but thanks to the shock and awe, I bet Jesus, was being the bearded brown man that he is, was attacked viciously and decided, you know what, we're not really worth it, and left. Thanks, America. You and the military-industrial complex fucked everyone out of heaven. You know, if, if, if heaven's like real and stuff. And this is not including the regular killings of black, brown, indigenous people at the hands of the police, a.k.a. rich people's mercenaries. So before America even utters the words human rights, it needs to clean up the factory that produces human rights violations at home and abroad. And now to abruptly switch the tone. Video games. The Xi Jinping administration is cracking down on video games, according to corporate media. Today, minors in China can't play more than three hours of video games on the weekend. They're also banned from playing video games during the week. And to most people, this sounds insane. But there is a cultural explanation to this. China's education system is, a, is high pressure and very, very competitive. Young people in China, you know, go to school uh, a lot more than kids in America do. They spend more time in the classroom. They spend more time doing homework. Uh, a normal school week in China isn't just, you know, Monday through Friday from, you know, 8.30 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, but it, it pretty much runs from from breakfast till dinner, and then they'll be doing a lot of homework after dinner. And they also go to school half a day on Saturdays. And many families, even even with the uh, you know the the efforts to to regulate private tutoring. So you start with bagels and biology, and end with steak and statistics. Plus, there's extracurriculars as well. So these kids don't likely have more than three hours of free time to play video game. And besides, this encourages kids to play outside, spend time with family read or pursue other creative outlets. Look, I'm a fan of video games. I think they're great for relieving stress, creative problem solving, dexterity, and ensuring that, you know, I don't follow you home and 
kill your whole family for cutting me off in traffic, you stupid fucking... Cr- I will find you, Corolla. I will fucking find you. <clears throat> but I put a restriction on myself for gaming as well, right? I gave myself an hour and a half to two hours, and then I have to move around or, or do something else. And I usually only can play video games once or twice a week. Uh, now, according to U.S. corporate media and neoliberals, I'd be considered self-authoritarian. To everyone with a functional brain, I'm showing like discipline and self-autonomy. But this law is aimed towards younger kids. You know, the ones that haven't figured out discipline or self-autonomy. I mean, for fuck's sake, I know people in their 40s with no discipline and self-autonomy. Look, video games tend to be addictive. Even to adults, okay? Just trust me on this. There was a moment where I would have sucked your dick for... Let's not... This is... It's not the time for this story. But, you know, video games can be addictive. These kids are likely to be less distracted and can concentrate on their education a little bit more. Look, I'm not a huge fan of this law, but I think it's far from authoritarian. It's not like they're jailing kids for playing video games for too long. There's no gulag for Grand Theft Auto. There's no prison for visiting the PlayStation store. There's no slammer for using Kirby's hammer. There's no jail time for playing Sands of Time. And there's no solitary confinement for online multiplayer enjoyment. But this law exists in various Southeast Asian countries. It's part of how competitive and rigorous the education system is. And because of that competitive culture, it allowed the private education industry to thrive and take root in China. The private tutoring companies that were primarily utilized by the rich in China were publicly traded on the stock market. So Xi Jinping has banned private tutoring corporations in China. I liked how the wording of the Ministry of, uh, of Education here led the, the ministry to call the, um, the ed- sector hijacked by capital. So this you know, policy was really coming in and saying, OK, enough with profiting off of the education sector, off of these students' anxieties, parents' anxieties, um, which obviously there's a litany. I don't even probably need to explain the many kinds of uh, abuses that some of these companies had in terms of trying to lure in families that are just pretty uh, anxious to get their schools ahead, uh, their students ahead. Um, and then so the, the rule is, is actually not that. Um, shocking. It's just saying that this industry uh, should not be for profit. Uh, this industry should not have foreign funding or shouldn't be listed on stock exchanges. Uh, and uh, the, also regulating some things about, oh, you know, on holidays and weekends, they shouldn't be uh, teaching these core courses. Um, so we've actually seen um, since then some some interesting improvements in how this is um, uh, addressing what is called education inequality. Because ultimately, common prosperity, one of the aspects is education, is if some people can kind of get this, get ahead through the secondary stream, it's going to weaken the resources in the public sector. So this is happening at the same time that other um, aspects of, you know, um, more funding into the public education system, uh, higher salaries per public education uh, teachers, uh, and also reducing things like uh, the amount of mandatory tests or, you know, this practice of posting the tests and the rankings of the tests at the schools, which is like hugely stressful for students yeah. and making those making, you know, other things like sports and arts education more priority than just, you know, cramming. And so uh, cracking down and it is a crackdown, a positive crackdown, let's say, on the private tutoring industry that was totally preying on this um, on, on young people and their parents. Um, I, I actually had advancement for people here. Education is a public commodity in China, and they don't believe that it's right to profit off that. But this is only part of the solution to the problem of education. If China wants to eradicate the exploitation of of their education system, then it has to be far less of a competitive culture. Competition to that level only opens the opportunities for exploitative capitalists to come in and profit off that need to be the best. Banning private tutoring is the first step. But it's hard for 
American media to attack China's policy of not commercializing education when most Americans are calling for an end to student debt and a restructuring of how education is looked at. So the story becomes about restricting kids' freedoms. And this is coming from the same country that wants to cancel the school lunch program because kids might get a little too used to eating food. And fuck all do I wish this was a joke. This is actually something a school board member said in Wisconsin back in August of 2021. They're claiming free lunches have, quote, spoiled American families who've become, quote, addicted to food. You know, the thing that prevents hunger and death, the thing that provides nutrition to your body, the thing that every living creature needs, food. Yeah, America wants to keep kids hungry for the sake of, quote, the economy, a.k.a. some rich asshole's bottom line. But yeah, China's policy of limiting video games for growing underdeveloped brains is really the problem here. I mean, the hypocrisy is enough to make your head spin. And and if your head's not spinning and, and this makes sense to you, look, I think you're probably having a nonstop stroke. Have you not gone to the doctor yet? You should really go and see a doctor. Look, if America cancels the school lunch program, which was started thanks to the black black socialists of the Black Panther Party, it'll only lead to an underground snack cartel in every playground in America. Kids dealing dime bags of gummy bears, eight balls of crushed up Oreos, and they'll be mainlining juice boxes and passing around the pudding cup. It's lick, lick, pass. Don't be a greedy bastard, Jeremy. A corporate media hides the actual truth by bending the truth about nations and ideologies that don't serve capitalism and its addicts. It's not hard to debunk the truth behind the headlines as long as you're willing to use, you know, a few extra brain cells. That's literally all it takes to push past propaganda. America is also a nation where capitalists run amok. Mega billionaires get to evade taxes regularly and hide their wealth in offshore accounts. That's right. American currency is getting more tans than the American people. The American political system that operates under legalized bribery is wildly corrupt, but at every turn is calling China corrupt. And there's a reason why. China is regulating its capitalists. Since 1979, when China resigned its isolationism and joined the world economy, there have been capitalists that have decided to headquarter themselves there. And thanks to the rapid industrialization of its economy, China has the world record on billionaires, which is another reason America is pissed, because they're no longer number one in the bastard bad boy billionaire department. Now, China has come up with an income cap that says after you make a certain amount of money, you have to give back to the Common Prosperity Program to help the Chinese people. And if they don't, these billionaires get a pretty substantial fine. Encouraging rich people and uh, private companies to contribute back. So this is philanthropy, it's donations. And we've actually seen um, one after another, these big tech firms, many of them, including like Alibaba, uh, have already gotten hit by these anti-monopoly practices, gotten big fines. Alibaba got $2.8 billion in fines. And soon after came out and said, okay, I'm going to donate $15.5 billion to Common Prosperity. And we've seen that billionaires lining up, huge celebrities, big tech firms waiting to basically say, okay, we will also pay back. People are framing it as a kind of Robin Hood, but, you know, many of these stay very wealthy billionaires, so you don't have to worry about that. There's still billionaires, guys. Yeah, there's still billionaires. It just would bring a little bit of, like, Trump change for, for them. Look, China is also going after big tech as well, particularly companies that deal with transactions. These corporations become micro-lending companies and start acting like a bank where especially these companies, they're so they're such mega platforms that they start branching into areas. And for, for Ant Group or Ant Financial, they were going into the sector of, you know, micro lending, uh, financial services, that they were really becoming to be 
act like a bank without having to follow the rules of the bank. And that is really a red line here. Uh, the banks are very quite tightly controlled. They're state owned. And so that is not an area that a private company can just say that I can go into and change the rules of an industry that you are not uh, a part of. So these companies were subverting government regulation of the banking industry and becoming private banks with a tech focus. This is also known as the American banking industry. China's anti-corruption law is strict enough that billionaires and CEOs themselves are becoming corruption watchdogs. Call me cynical, but I don't see America legislating against billionaires and the CEOs. Billionaires keep getting tax loopholes because they own politicians that write the laws. In China, billionaires don't have any influence over politicians. And they're sure shit ain't getting person of the year named by a fucking neoliberal out of touch magazine. Again, this by no means is saying that China has officially defeated capitalism and the concept of corruption itself, but it is maintaining it and it still has a lot of work to do. Gig economy workers in China are exploited in the same manner as gig economy workers in the US. Gig economy workers work 12 hour days in order to earn enough income to survive. The CEOs say that the workers should be blessed for this job and it's, quote, flexibility. So the Chinese government is in the process of cracking down on this level of exploitation as well. And China also has plans to use data for public good. And then another part is, is a big part is data. You know, the question of who owns data, how data is used, how does it get processed? Uh, all of that, I mean, is is like of an kind of utmost urgency everywhere we go. And of course, um, you know, uh, Ant Group uh, and it's, uh, what's it called? The transaction payment app, Alipay, actually annually transacts more money than the GDP of China. It's a huge amount of money that they're circulating. And it means that every single purchase that is made, they have the data on that, you know, what people are looking for, what they're searching for, what they want. So that kind of stuff right now, the, the government is going through big conversations about treating that as a public good. And I actually mm -hmm. think that's quite an interesting debate. Like data isn't something that should be just in the hands of the private companies because it is, I mean, a public good. And so there's a huge amount of interesting debate about how data should be um, uh, should be treated, uh, who should own it, who should manage it, manage it, and how the government should come in. One of the ways they executed this idea was in their response to COVID. Everywhere you went, you had to scan your phone, so it registered who was there. Now, this sounds super intrusive, but that information was used by the health ministry to send messages to people if they've been in the same space as someone who contracted COVID. This is how they were able to stay ahead of the pandemic. Their personal information protection law prevents the data to be used for consumerism, tracking, spying, or selling that data for any number of mostly nefarious reasons. This means you won't get an ad for cheese on your Instagram because your girlfriend's friend posted about cheese. And look, that's not really an exaggeration. A few Christmases ago, when I was still married, my ex-wife was looking at a purse. About 10 minutes later, as I was scrolling through Facebook, I got an ad for that exact purse she was looking at on her phone. Now, big tech simps will say it's just a coincidence or that good old Zuck was trying to help my marriage. But look, I think we all know better. Zuck doesn't give a fuck when he's trying to turn a buck. So the big question here is whether China is a capitalist or socialist country. The mainstream answer is it really depends. But the real answer is that China's perspective is and has been socialist. The goal is to build a socialist society. Land, labor, technology, capital, and data are meant to, it meant to be used to uplift the lives of every Chinese person. This means that this is a society where individuals live with each other with a collective responsibility. Look, there is no roadmap to build socialism. I mean, one can make the argument about capitalism. The difference is capitalism doesn't learn from its mistakes. It just figures out how to hide them 
for a little bit. Slavery is arguably one of the largest mistakes made by capitalism, and yet it uses slave labor to drive consumerism. At least with socialist governments, they're trying to figure out how to reduce repeating the same mistakes and come up with newer solutions. The expectation of capitalists is that after a socialist or communist revolution, there should be a utopia the day after. They use this absurd messaging mixed with flowery faux academic language to discredit the work being done to build a socialist society from rubble. The real reason for so much Western aggression over China is because it proves that socialism does in fact work even in a country as large as China. And China and America are inexplicably linked considering China is the world's manufacturer. It shows that after 1979, China was more in control of American capitalism than America was. Consider how many American flags and American flag underwears are made in China. Look, even Marx and Engel talk about marketization being good for creativity and innovation. That's what they did when they opened up to the rest of the world. They figured out a way to use capital to develop social programs and equitable distribution. Look, isolationism is inherently not socialist. You can't be a socialist if you're not, well, you know, social. So when it comes to critiques about China, it really depends what's convenient for capitalists. Anything that benefits China and grows their economy is obviously because America's capitalist influence is to help them out. But when they implement laws like restricting hours for video games or regulating billionaires, it's because they're authoritarian socialists. Bush, shit, there's that oxymoron migraine. Fuck. Look, China used socialism to eradicate poverty and is an example of what you can do when you put the lives of people in front of profit. And it can help other countries achieve the same thing. Capitalist giants like America tried to stop this progress since the beginning with economic sanction, militarism, and this, and spreading misinformation. But that's like kicking someone when they're down. But the plan is failing because China is now on its way to construct a society that looks beyond capitalism. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video and podcast. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button uh, and please make sure that you are subscribed to this channel, whether you are watching this on YouTube or Rockfin or Odyssey or Facebook or listening to the audio version, please make sure that you are subscribed to receive updates to know when I'm putting out new videos because uh, I put out videos uh, on, a, on a relatively regular basis. Uh, and uh, the easiest way to keep up with everything that I do is by joining my free email list. I send out one email every single Sunday uh, that gives you a list of all of the videos and podcasts I've released. And sometimes you get some bonus uh, short stories and real life stories as well. Uh, not only that, you can also become a sustaining member making monthly contributions, which gets you a bunch of bonus stuff like uh, bonus stand up shows, bonus stand up comedy content uh, and, uh, and and bonus videos that, that, that you get uh, from me as well. So there's tons of bonus stuff that you get by becoming a sustaining member uh, and you can get tickets to be in the virtual audience of the next Forkful of Noodles recording, which happens on the last Thursday of every month at 8 p.m. All of this information, all of these links are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. I want to thank everybody that, that has subscribed, has liked, has shared all of my content, has become sustaining members. You guys are, are uh, uh, big reasons that, that, sh that shows like this continue to, to be made and the quality of these shows continue to improve. So thank you very much uh, from the bottom of my heart. I really, really appreciate you guys. Uh, but till the next one, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we'll see you on the road.